Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to Lockdown Oboe Solo Concert number 11. Tonight represents my final of 11 concerts I planned at the beginning of COVID-19 quarantine. I had planned to make my way all the way through the Telemann Fantasies, which will be accomplished tonight, and I also thought it was a good way to bide my time alone and perhaps our time alone as well. I naively thought that things might be back to normal on May 29th and that I might have to reschedule this final concert um, because I would be playing at the BSO, but unfortunately that is not the case and we have a better idea of the scope of the situation now. So I anticipate probably doing a few more of these shows here and there. I'm looking for ideas, um, but I plan to take tomorrow off the oboe at least. And I have another um, live streamed concert with another person, how wonderful, uh, next Saturday, June 6th, um, with my wonderful colleague from the BSO, Lachazar Kostov. Uh, he's a cellist, so we're gonna have a cello oboe program from very far across the stage. Um, it should be exciting. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, there's, there are details on my Facebook page. Um, but without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce you to the next Telemann Fantasy. This is number 12 in G minor and the last of 12.
So next up is Syrinx by Claude Debussy. And this Debussy and the next piece by Thea Musgrave both derive inspiration from the same ancient myths we see in the um, Six Metamorphoses after Ovid by Benjamin Britten, which I will play following all of that. Um, Ovid was an ancient, an ancient Roman poet, and his Metamorphoses were a single poem in many, many volumes, and probably considered to be his magnum opus. Um, but the story of Pan and Syrinx, uh, we see here um, by Debussy, and also in the Britten piece. It's a tale of unwelcome pursuit uh, of a woman, um, which uh, causes her ultimate destruction. Uh, we also see a similar story with Arethusa in the final movement of the Britain. Um, Debussy's work was written in 1913 as incidental music to Gabrielle Maury's play Siche. Uh, it was originally entitled La Flute de Pan, uh, which means Pan's flute, um, but later changed to Syrinx. And this is how the story goes. Um, Pan was a half goat, half man, as you can see depicted here, who was in love with uh, the nymph Syrinx, who did not return his feelings. Um, he tried to seduce her, and she turned herself into a water reed and hid in the marsh. And uh, Pan cut the reeds in order to make a pipe, uh, pipes to play on, and he killed Syrinx and played on her dead.
So next up is a piece by the Scottish-American composer Thea Musgrave. Uh, I had her on a previous show, I think it was the sixth one, not entirely sure, but uh, we got to hear from her her thoughts on music and performers, which was lovely. And um, I wanted to play this piece because I think it goes so well with uh, the Britain and the Debussy, because it focuses on Niobe. And um, she left a program note, which I should read because um, better to hear from her than from me. Um, but the piece was written in 1987 and employs a pre-recorded tape that floats about the oboe universe. Uh, I have to thank um, my friend Krista Garvey so much for getting it for me in these COVID times, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do this. Um, so I will play on, that M on top of that MP3 file, MP4, I'm not even sure. Um, with my headphones, and hopefully be coordinated along. Um, it's a lament, basically, for, uh, for you know, dead children, but I think this idea of lamenting dead family members is unfortunately something many of us can relate to, uh, especially perhaps with the horrible news of the past week. Um, so here is her, her statement about the piece. Niobe, written in July and November 1987, was commissioned by the Park Lane Group for Ian Hardwick. The tape was made in Chien Interdit Studios in New York, recording engineer Jonathan Mann. In Greek mythology, Niobe was the daughter of Tantalus and wife of Amphion, king of Thebes. She unwisely boasted to Leto about her many sons and daughters. Leto, who had only two children, Apollo and Artemis, was angered. As punishment, Apollo slew all of Niobe's sons and Artemis all her daughters. Out of pity for Niobe's inconsolable grief, the gods changed her into a rock in which form she continued to weep. In this short work for solo oboe and tape, the solo oboe takes the part of Niobe bitterly lamenting her murdered children. The tape with its distant high voices and slow tolling bells and later gong is intended to provide an, an evocative and descriptive accompaniment.
I'm returning to the Britain Six Metamorphoses after Ovid because I haven't played them all together on one of these concerts yet, and they are for sure the most famous piece we have for oboe alone, and many pieces have been inspired by those pieces. In fact, I've played several of them for you already in these lockdown oboe solo programs. Um, one thing I should mention is I screwed up, and I should have probably played this last week um, because I just learned two days ago that the premiere of this piece in 1951 at the Aldeburgh, Aldeburgh Festival in, um, in the UK, uh, where Britain was the music director, um, actually happened with the performer and the audience in boats and punts. So um, it would have been pretty appropriate last week, but, but I, I missed that boat. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but the one thing I really did want to do is pair it with um, the Ben Hausman piece that comes after it. So, so it's good it's here in this, in this form. Um, I've had a little thing in, in the past several shows where I interview composers or I, I make it so you can meet them. And uh, I would like to do that with Benjamin Britten, but unfortunately he's no longer alive. Um, but I do have some wonderful clips from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation that I can share. Um, they're from an interview in 1968. And, you know, I've described the myths in more detail. I just did Niobe and Pan, um, but I've described them in more detail in the past shows. So I'm just going to give you the, um, the program information that Britton gives us um, right after you hear him speak a little bit. I have to write for people or for occasions. I get inspiration. I get incentive uh, for writing for people. That is uh, my greatest pleasure and almost, as I say, the only way I can write. I believe that the artist must be consciously a human being. He is part of society and he should not lock himself up in a, an ivory tower. Uh, I think he has a duty to play towards his, uh, to his fellow creatures. Um, it is not only a duty, I feel it's a pleasure too. I want to have my music used. I would much rather, this seems perhaps a, a silly thing to say, but I would rather have my music used than write masterpieces which were not used. The word masterpiece has a, a kind of ring about it which uh, suggests lots of dusts in vol on volumes in libraries. All instruments, I think, really try at their height to imitate the human voice. I mean, why does a composer write, if he's using Italian terms, as, as many of us do, cantabile, if he wants a phrase, beautifully played, because it's going to be sung. I think that the human voice is the loveliest of all instruments. But of course, there are many occasions when a, a flute, when it's beautifully played, a violin, or the cello, when Rostropovich plays it, then there are, one feels there are very few voices as beautiful as that. If an artist has everything too easy, sometimes the thing becomes a little glib. He doesn't, if he knows he can have as big an orchestra as he wants, he thinks of 17 bass clarinets. Uh, that is not a healthy thing. He must trim his art into the, into the, the uh, form that is most suited.
So next up is the piece that I really wanted to pair with this. Um, by It's a world premiere, and it's by my dear old friend, Ben Hausman. I think Ben would probably describe himself first as a pianist, but perhaps uh, he might call himself a composer first, I'm not sure, but he's a Renaissance man uh, at any rate. Uh, he's also a poet and oboist in the Seattle Symphony. Um, we both met when we were students at the Juilliard School, and we became fast friends there. Uh, we accompanied each other in the concerto competition there, and he graduated, and I did not. Um, I asked Ben to write this piece in early April, when he was having a bad time, and I wanted to get him out of bed and out of his bathrobe. Um, so he did write this piece for me, and it took him only three days, which is pretty amazing, um, but he did not take off the bathrobe. Um, I asked him to make some brief program notes uh, and chose not to interview him here and just have the program notes instead because I knew it would require far too much editing of inappropriate material. So here is Ben. Thank you, Catherine, for enabling all of this. One of my ultimate heroes, Rachmaninoff, said, I write music to give expression to my feelings just as I speak to give expression to my thoughts. I love that sentiment. I've been told by many people to create a work of art that incorporates both poetry and music, and I wanted a solo performer to do just that. First movement, Eros, passionate love, cast in E flat minor because that was the first key Catherine mentioned when she also mentioned that maybe the number six could inspire this work of art. And since E flat minor has six flats, I thought, why not go ba -da 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 -de -dum, six notes as the germ. After I wrote an E flat minor movement about Eros, the most passionate form of love, I, I wanted to read a sonnet I wrote months ago <laughs> that starts with, I hate love. I once loved love, but now? Because I was dumped by the love of my life. So that sort of was the beginning of this whole process. The second movement, Ludus, is playful love. The third movement is Storge, and I'm sorry, I don't speak Greek, is basically the love between parents and children. The fourth movement, philia, the love that one forms with a friend in childhood that lasts for life. The fifth movement, pragma, is the love between two people throughout life as partners. The last movement, philatcha, self-love. That can go two ways. The bad way is that one loves oneself so much at the expense of others and their partners. And I struggled with loving myself as a human being. No one can love another human being until they love themselves. Everybody seems to agree on that. That was hardest for me. And I tried to encapsulate that in music where it's not sure which way it's going to go, that it could be good or bad, and I even quote the Dies Irae very briefly. But I hope in the end it's a satisfactory conclusion to a six-movement work that I am very grateful for Catherine asking me to create. So please enjoy.
I hate love. I once loved love, but now I hate what love might bring to life because we shared such moments true, which now would wow each walk of life. We loved what once twice was. We shared new moments, memories, and gifts, and shed tough tears while worldwide wound deceased. This epidemic gone now viral shifts true loves by ways while none's extremes decreased. Blue blossoms bloom midst all amongst mess, and I hope you might see one's crazied world in all its present state and glory, whereby spy one soul we choose and soon begin to fall again toward mindless maddening above ourselves, a state we simply label love. Since you asked, just let me count the ways. The sound of just your voice, the words you use, just melts my heart each time and waves the waves our lives do crash together while we fuse our brains and hearts and families. I love how much you love your nucleus and wish to God I am to be but part of it above all else you might fear shallow, not our dish. I love your trust in how you speak your mind, your genius as at least a linguist still, and or above all that, you love my kind and tender words. Your love forms hope, will will that all these words might one day see you know, my hope one day you'll know I love you so.
choosing family so we can live that happy ever after both so we've not one regret nor doubt to free our minds and souls in ways that doubly quoth that phrase that means so little till to show it's meaningless to them, not us, but hope us all we had just that which shows no woe to life as they foretell, whilst we elope into some darkness whence none well can see, then free themselves of their own blindness, then begin to see their light in which all free to see their spirits soar, which then amen their miracles of life as we have ours, immune to all in life which sometimes sours. They all say passion fades, but don't agree. It's not the aging of our bodies, but the sudden realization how our free and loving minds mesh more than what we strut. For instance, I loved you far long before my crush you know too well and feared was all. The other crushes on you, I implore you own to understand. Twas musical, emotional, and mental first. So when we're hundreds old, I'll love you as I do right now, because my crush was not as then when most our ages met, then focused too much on the surface of the age, but now shall find the turning tide a realist's vow.
love the gentle tinkle of my wind chime, pulsing life from air-breathed trees to us. So lulled into this home alone and sinned rhyme, futures rest within our souls a plus. On second thought, our hearts tell brains up front our deepest needs to act our ways through life on impulse waves by brain or heart, and hunt our spouse and hope he says, I do, my wife. Of all the things in life we cherish, this much more than all our hopes and fears, just one each needs to share. A pact sealed with a kiss, young love knows well for life beneath the sun. Just now we've found that well within ourselves, undying love which through each life each delves. So thank you so much, Ben, for writing that amazing new work for the oboe. I hope to do it justice someday. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure, I'm a little out of breath, sorry, uh, spending time uh, to make music for everyone, uh, preparing all this new music every week for the last 11 weeks in lockdown has been a wonderful experience for me. So I do plan to be back in some form or another. Um, but uh, I think I might take a few days off. Uh, it's been pretty all-consuming with, with all this stuff. I need to thank my family for putting up with me while I've been doing a lot of crazy oboeing. Um, and especially my three children who have miraculously not bothered me. Um, my wonderful husband got called out to the hospital just before the show. 
and my kids, I haven't heard from them, so um, my bribes are well in place, I guess. Um, uh, and I, I also mostly need to thank you all for listening, um, for listening to these shows. Um, I want to present one last song for you, um, and I just put it together today. And it's, uh, it's not a piece I know well, certainly not well enough, um, but I find it very important and inspiring. And so here is my quick lockdown version. Um, the pianist recorded her part this morning, um, after her morning run and before her shower. So apologies for that, she is not a professional. Um, and so I'm going to play live on top of her part, uh, very much in the way that I played the Musgrave. Um, I received an online tag or challenge yesterday from another friend of mine from the past, uh, from school, uh, the clarinetist Anthony McGill, and we went to the Curtis Institute of Music together, and I did graduate from there, by the way. Um, and Anthony is now the principal clarinet of the New York Philharmonic, so I can say that uh, way back when, uh, last century, I learned the Mozart and Beethoven piano wind quintets, Dvorak serenades, all those big serenades with Anthony. Um, so a few days ago, he created a hashtag movement called hashtag take two knees, uh, in his words, uh, for the struggle for justice and decency. So I am uh, without words personally uh, or solutions to our current problems, but I know the news of the past week has been very difficult for very many people in our country. Um, so I'm going to play for you Strange Fruit. It was written in 1937, originally as a poem, and uh, later set to music um, by the Jewish-American Abel Mirapol. Uh, he wrote this in response to photos of people picnicking under lynched bodies in the American South. Uh, he convinced Billie Holiday to take the song on and sing it, uh, which she started to do in 1939. And she championed the work, um, an act which may be responsible for her early death. Nina Simone, who sang the song very amazingly, said, This is about the ugliest song I have ever heard. Ugly in the sense that it is violent and tears at the guts of what white people have done to my people in this country. So I encourage you, if you find this song at all moving here without the words, uh, to please listen to Nina Simone or Billie Holiday sing this and read the lyrics. Thank you and good night. So sorry, I screwed up the coordination. I gotta do this again. <laughs> 